Welcome to the Royal Society Croonian Lecture. I'm Linda Partridge, the Biological Secretary and Vice President of the Royal Society, and it's my pleasure to host the lecture. In normal times, it would take place at the Royal Society headquarters in Carlton House Terrace, but the pandemic means that this time it's happening online. We've nonetheless made the best of the opportunities on the web and there will be a live question and answer session at the end of the lecture. So please do send in your questions through the slido.com link with code 209 and we'll have live questions and answers after the lecture's over. The Croonian Medal and Lecture is the premier lecture in the biological sciences and it has been awarded to Professor Edward Boyden in 2020 for his inventions that expand our understanding of the brain and allow therapeutic development, including the co-invention of optogenetics, the technology that has revolutionized neurobiology. Ed Boyden is the Y. Eva Tan Professor in Neurotechnology at Massachusetts Institute of Technology He's an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the MIT McGovern Institute and professor of brain and cognitive sciences, media arts and sciences and biological engineering at MIT. He leads the synthetic neurobiology group, uh, which develops tools for analyzing and repairing complex biological systems such as the brain and applies them systematically to reveal ground truth principles of biological function, as well as to repair these systems. Ed Boyden is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Inventors, as well as the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. And I now invite him to give the 2020 Croonian Lecture entitled Shining a Light on the Brain. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to be here today to receive the Cronian Medal and to get to give you a lecture today about uh, our work, which is on technologies for understanding and repairing the brain with a focus on using light as a modality to look at and control the brain. So uh, I direct a group at MIT that works on technologies that allow us to look at and control brain circuits. Brain circuits are incredibly complicated they implement our thoughts and feelings, they make us who we are, and they go wrong in diseases that we cannot fully cure. So our hope is to understand the complexity of the brain. Now, in a cubic millimeter of your brain are 100,000 cells called neurons, connected by a billion connections called synapses. It's arguably one of the most complicated things in the known universe. So how can we understand how can we repair such a complex thing? Well, today I want to tell you about tools that we've been building that allow us to see and control this complex system. Why is it so difficult? Well, the spatial complexity is enormous. Brain cells are gigantic objects. They can span centimeters in our brain, but the wiring of the brain is nanoscale thin projections called axons and dendrites, nanoscale connections called synapses, which allow information to be conveyed from one brain cell to the next. And then thousands and thousands of kinds of biomolecule, nanoscale objects encoded by our genome, which interact in complex ways. How can you see something that's large, like the brain, in terms of these nanoscale building blocks? That's a big challenge, space. But it's worse. Time is also a challenging aspect. If you care about the formation of a memory, the progression of Alzheimer's disease, learning a language for a baby, these processes take days, months, years. But brain cells compute using very brief electrical and chemical events. Millisecond time scale electrical events in neurons called spikes, and millisecond time scale chemical exchanges at synapses. So not only is the brain spatially incredibly complicated, the temporal complexity is also enormous. 
Well, of course, one of our goals is to understand thinking, feeling, and other traits that make us who we are. But there's another an urgent problem. Brain diseases like Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, addiction, and the list goes on and on, affect over a billion people around the world. None of these can be fully cured. And the treatments are often very partial and have a lot of side effects. Indeed, 10 years ago, there was an editorial in Science Magazine, which asked the scary question, are we running out of ideas for confronting brain diseases? It noted that drugs for treating brain conditions can take almost a decade to go from the laboratory into human use. The failure rate to get approval for human use is almost 100%. The cost is enormous. And even after all that, the treatments often don't work very well. So in our group, we set out to ask the question, well, if this is so difficult confronting problems of the brain, why don't we accelerate the underlying science so that it becomes feasible? And we asked the following questions. Can we understand the brain to the point where you could simulate it in a computer? Can we observe brain computations in action, control them so we can repair brain dysfunction, and finally make a map of the brain in all of its complexity? So today I wanna to tell you two stories, one about space and one about time, where we have built new strategies for looking at and repairing brain circuitry. Let's start with space. So as I mentioned, brain cells are incredibly complex. Remember within a cubic millimeter, 100,000 brain cells and a billion connections between them. How can we understand such a complex network? And how can we understand the molecules within the brain cells? How are they organized into networks of their own? Well, the traditional answers are brain scans, like the one you see here. I think we've, we've all seen images like this taken with magnetic resonance imaging machines. But these machines are not measuring brain wiring or brain activity directly. Instead, they are measuring blood flow associated with brain activity. And each of these yellow blobs or voxels, as they're known, contains millions, perhaps billions of brain cells. And uh, we are unable to watch them in real time because the blood flow is what we're seeing. On the other hand, it's not an invasive and therefore very popular for looking at the human brain. At the other extreme is the microscope. The microscope was used to discover brain cells in the first place over 100 years ago. It's able to look at very small objects, but not small enough because light has a finite size or wavelength and therefore we cannot see individual molecules or even individual wires in the brain. So how can we deal with this problem? Well, in our group, we often try to think about doing the opposite of what people are doing. And so we had the following idea. What if rather than zooming in on the brain with a microscope, we could make the brain physically larger? Not a living brain, but a preserved brain. We took inspiration from the field of swallowable polymers. So in this cartoon, you can see a swallowable polymer, like the stuff you find in baby diapers. Add water and the water is absorbed. As the water is absorbed, the polymer threads shown as white lines will be repelled from each other and grow. An experiment that millions of children do every day. So we wondered, what if we could chemically weave a dense spider web like mesh of swellable polymer inside of brain cells and outside of brain cells, in between biomolecules and around biomolecules? If we did it just right, could we physically magnify the brain? Could we make the brain physically larger? Well, in 2015, we announced that this was possible. In panel B is a small piece of the mouse brain, and in panel C, is the same piece of mouse brain. Um, about a day and a half later, we formed the polymer, softened the brain and added water, and we made it a hundred times bigger in volume. The polymer starts at very dense, like in the upper left cartoon, and it ends up expanded, like in the lower left cartoon. 
Here's a time-lapse movie of the final step where we add the water, which is absorbed by the baby diaper polymer throughout the brain, and the brain becomes bigger. Usually the process takes like about an hour, but to speed it up for the purposes of the lecture, to, we shortened it to one minute. And I hope you can see that this polymerized brain is expanding right there. Do you see it growing before your eyes? A little pipette that is sometimes popping into the frame is how we add the water. Okay. So the basic idea therefore is can we take a brain cell like the golden one on the left of this cartoon and physically pull all the biomolecules apart from each other so that it turns into something like the constellation on the right. Biomolecules hovering in space in three dimensions, um, separated, but they will have the same relative organization as when they were in the brain itself. Two biomolecules that were touching are now some minimum distance apart, and two biomolecules that were some distance apart will now be scaled up by a linear factor. Well, to make this work, we had to invent several novel chemistries. So this cartoon shows biomolecules in brown and anchors or handles in purple. For each kind of biomolecule, DNA, RNA, proteins, and so on, we had to build a little handle that would bind to them. That gives us the means to pull them apart. Second, we had to weave that dense spider web-like mesh of soluble polymer in between and around the biomolecules. We do this through a process called polymerization. The little white spheres are called monomers and they self-assemble into long polymer strands. The spacing is very dense. And when the polymer strand encounters a handle, it forms a molecular bond. So if you think about it, the polymers can expand the handle means the biomolecules will come along for the ride. But there's one last step. We have to soften the brain. So we add detergents or heat or enzymes to loosen everything up. And then we add water. The baby diaper polymer, sodium polyacrylate, will swell, absorbing the water. And through those handles or anchors, the biomolecules will now be pulled apart from each other. What this means is we can now make maps of the brain because regular old microscopes, the kind that are found everywhere in biology and medicine, are now nanoimaging devices. At the bottom is a piece of the mouse brain expressing fluorescent proteins, glowing proteins from jellyfish and coral. Basically, the neurons get a color code. In the top of the slide, in the middle, you can see zooming in with a regular microscope to try to look at the wiring but it's blurry. The wiring is nanoscale. The upper right though, is the same field of view as in the top middle, but this is after we expanded it. And now the wiring can be seen clearly. So our hope therefore, is that we can start to make detailed maps of brain circuits and molecules inside brain cells. One of my hopes is that we can make maps of the brain so detailed that we can simulate brain computations in a computer. This would have great implications for understanding thinking, decisions, emotions, and feelings, but it also might lead to new kinds of artificial intelligence, which might have more properties like that of the brain. I also hope we can make maps of brain diseases so we can figure out where in the brain to intervene. This is important because again, for many brain diseases, we just don't know where to begin. So, this is kind of one of our models. We share technologies very freely. We build a tool, we call this one expansion microscopy, and then we give it out to people all over the world to apply to their research. Hundreds of studies have already appeared using expansion microscopy to investigate the brain and other biological systems. And that's one of the great themes of brain technology. If you build a tool to confront the brain, it might be important for other complex biological problems. That's because the spatial and temporal scales that I mentioned earlier are not unique to the brain. If you want to understand or address cancer or aging or development or the immune system, you need to be able to study those systems across space and time as well. I'll give you one example. We were approached by many doctors asking 
can you detect cancer earlier? Well, if you can catch a cancer before it spreads, you can save more lives. So this is a, a picture here of a breast cancer biopsy, which we expanded and then looked at with doctors to see if we could do more accurate diagnosis. After all, early in a disease, it's hard to see the very fine scale changes. But if we made those changes big and obvious, maybe we could detect diseases earlier. Indeed, a committee of doctors was able to diagnose these expanded breast cancer biopsies much more consistently with each, in agreement with each other than if we used unexpanded specimens. And so one of our hopes is we can use such strategies to train new machine learning algorithms to detect diseases earlier than before possible. So that's the story that I wanted to tell you about space. We started with an invention. Let's physically make brains larger. We're helping people make discoveries, like how is the brain wired? And finally, we're helping people design applications, like early disease detection. In the second half of the talk, I want to tell you a story about time. Because of course, space is not enough. We also need to understand how brain circuits generate dynamics that leads to the ebb and flow of thought and feeling. Now, brain cells compute using fast electrical pulses. We could control them by giving drugs, but those are slow. Also, they'll affect all the brain cells more or less in an, a nondescript, nonspecific way. What if we could install little solar panels in brain cells? Then we could shine light on them and turn them on or off. The solar panels convert light to electricity. The brain cells respond to the electricity. The brain does not feel pain, so you can bring optical fibers or other probes into the brain. And now the question is, how do you make brain cells respond to light? Well, all over the tree of life, there are molecules that convert light into electrical signals. I became fascinated by a particular kind called the microbial opsin. This is a molecule that many microbes have that converts light into an electrical signal directly. Over the years, we and our colleagues and collaborators have found that certain microbial opsins are fast enough, safe enough, and powerful enough to be expressed in neurons. You can use a gene therapy vector to deliver the gene to the brain, and then neurons will take up the gene and manufacture proteins. These proteins will then convert light into electrical signals. You can bring positive charge out of a cell, shutting it down, as shown on the left, or you can bring positive charge into a cell, activating it, as shown on the right. Let me walk you through just one example of how this amazing class of molecules works. Green algae contain a microbial opsin that helps them sort of see light to help them navigate in bodies of water. The brownish blob in this single-celled algae is the eye spot. Let's zoom into it. Inside the eye spot are proteins, the very microbial opsins that I mentioned earlier. When you hit them with light of the right color, they open up a small pore and let charged particles, ions, across the pore. Those particles then cause electrical depolarization of this eye spot membrane. If you think about it, that's exactly what we want to do to the neurons to turn them on. If we could turn a neuron on, we could try to discover what it does, right? We could try to fix a brain pathology state. So we were very lucky. It turns out that these microbial opsins are encoded by small pieces of DNA, small genes small enough that we can put them into gene therapy vectors, the kind used in human patients to treat diseases, deliver the virus or gene therapy vector into the brain. And then amazingly, brain cells, neurons could manufacture these proteins and install them in the right place, the outside of the brain cell. Even more remarkably, delicate neurons tolerated this molecule's expression. And finally, when we shine light, we can activate these molecules, which would then generate electrical pulses that go throughout the brain cell. Much like how, as you hear me say these words, your brain cells in your auditory system are generating electrical pulses. How do we use these molecules? 
Well, the brain contains lots of different kinds of cells, some large, some small, some activate their neighbors and some, some shut them down. My collaborator, Li Wei Sai, took this molecule and put them into a set of small star-shaped cells called basket cells for their shape. Then she asked, if you drive these cells, what can they do? Can they control the network around them? Amazingly, what she found was that indeed they could. When she activated these cells, they could drive the local brain network at a very specific resonant frequency, 40 hertz or 40 times per second. Her group, with some help from us, went on to find out that in mice engineered to get Alzheimer's-like symptoms, if you drove the brain at this magical frequency, the brains would get better. This was very interesting, of course, because so far, Alzheimer's treatments have pretty much all failed their clinical trials. It's one of the toughest diseases to treat. And so far, there are no approved treatments that slow or stop disease progression for Alzheimer's disease. But Li Wei's group found that if you drive the brain at this magical frequency, the brain gets better. Under Li Wei's leadership, the teams went on to show that you could cause these same brain waves through flickering lights and clicking sounds. And now human trials with Alzheimer's patients are ongoing using effectively movies to try to see if the brain can be healed. So these studies are ongoing, um, uh, but my hope is that, fingers crossed, that they will go well. What are other things you can do with optogenetics, as we call this technology? Opto for light and genetics because you can use these small genes without needing elaborate additional technology. Well, Chris Fiorilla's group studies addiction and reward, and they asked, could you activate certain cells deep in the brains of mice and cause the brain to do more of a given thing? So you might have heard of dopamine neurons. They're often talked about as the pleasure center of the brain in the popular press. But of course, everything in neuroscience is more complicated than it sounds. And so Chris's group asked, could you activate these cells and cause the brain to reinforce certain patterns of behavior? So they placed mice with these dopamine neurons engineered with our light activated protein, implanted an optical fiber in the brain aimed at these cells and put the mice in a box. If the mice poke their nose into a, the right hand corner of the box, then they would get a pulse of blue light, the, light, the right color to activate these molecules. If they poke their nose into the left, lower left-hand side of the box, then they would not get a pulse of blue light. Here's the movie. Mouse pokes its nose, gets a pulse of blue light. Does it again, gets another pulse of blue light. I think you can see the pattern. Basically, activating these cells with blue light is causing the brain to do more of what it was just doing, at least in the context of this behavior. So this is very helpful if one is trying to study something like addiction, because you can pinpoint neurons that make the brain do more of a certain thing. Now, as I mentioned earlier, all over the tree of life, you can find these molecules. And so far, I've shown you some examples using a molecule from algae to activate neurons. But there's an even older class of molecules, which was studied in the 1970s and 1980s, which allows you to turn neurons off, we found. These are light-driven pumps that bring negative charge into a neuron or positive charge out of a neuron. Shine light of the right color and you can shut down a neuron. This lets you figure out what it's needed for because you can delete it just for a moment. Uh, I'll just give you an example of how you can use this. So Akahiro Yamanaka's group was studying narcolepsy, a condition where people will fall asleep at random times. Patients with narcolepsy lack a small cluster of cells called hypocretin or orexin neurons. So in this study, what Akihiro and his team did was to engineer mice with a light-driven ion pump in these neurons, and then implanted an optical fiber aimed at these neurons connected to a yellow laser. Yellow is the color of light that will drive these molecules. And so then you could turn these neurons off. Here's what they found. These are mice, they start out awake, and then they turn the laser on, shown as the orangish bar, and the mice fall asleep within half a minute. 
they stay asleep, all of them, until the light is turned off, upon which they wake up. So activating neurons lets you figure out what kinds of behaviors or states they can trigger. Shutting down neurons lets you figure out what those neurons are needed for. Now in our group, we've been working to perfect these tools. What does that mean? Well, we want to make the tools as powerful as possible, as fast as possible, and as non-invasive as possible. We also want to make them as focal as possible, because of course, individual brain cells, if we could control them one by one, that would be fantastic. As one example, we have developed molecules that respond to red light. Why red light? Well, red light goes deeper in the brain and in the rest of the body, frankly, than other colors of visible light. That's because red light is less absorbed by the blood and by other tissues in the brain. That's why blood looks red. So we found light-driven pumps, such as one that we call JAWS, which is driven by red light. And now you can turn neurons off, even in large volumes of the brain, by red light. We found a molecule that we named crimson, which allows you to activate neurons with red light. Crimson is also interesting because while these tools are having their greatest impact as tools for science, discovering patterns of activity that control behavior or that initiate clinically relevant states, such as the putative Alzheimer's treatment state, there's also the possibility in the future that these could be used therapeutically directly in people. And although it's early days, this molecule, crimson, the red light activator, is in human trials for treating blindness. So to summarize the second part of the talk, we found that molecules from the natural world, microbial opsins, installed in the brain, allow us to control the brain very precisely, letting us turn brain cells on or off. And just as with the expansion of microscopy that I mentioned in the first half of the talk, the optogenetic tools, as we call them, we've also disseminated freely, giving them to literally thousands of researchers at this point to activate and shut down neural activity to study how the brain works. Where does this all go? Well, in addition to disseminating the tools freely throughout science, we're also very interested in using the tools as well. And so in the final part of the talk, I would like to point to the future. As I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, we want to cure brain diseases and we want to understand how the brain computes interesting things like thinking and feeling. That means we need to disseminate the tools to the public so people can use them, but we also need to integrate the tools so we can use them together. My dream experiment is to look at the brain in action, control the brain in action, and then at the end of the day, use our expansion method to make a map of the wiring of the brain. Can we integrate these three kinds of information to yield a computational model of how the brain works. Well, I think that we can begin this process in the near future by working with small brains. The history of biology says, if you want to understand something, start with something small. The first genome to be sequenced was not the human genome, but they were the genomes of small viruses and bacteria. Small animals, like fruit flies, have yielded insight into our circadian rhythms that govern our waking and sleeping. Worms like C. elegans, which has only 959 cells, have taught us about how cells um, born, divide, and die, and so on and so forth. So one hope that we have is that we can start with small brains, like those of worms and fish. Image all the activity, control all the activity, and make a map of all the wiring and the molecules along those wires. If we can use such a strategy to make computational models of small brains, perhaps that will yield principles of how neurons work in networks, which can help us understand how larger brains, like the human brain perhaps, are working. And so one thing we're working on now is creating tools for imaging brain activity. Um, one of the interesting things is that these optogenetic molecules that I mentioned earlier, um, you can run them in reverse. You can convert them into forms that let brain cells light up in a microscope when they're active. 
So we've been uh, starting to enter this area and have been building robots to evolve molecules to have improved such properties. And so here's an example of a fish brain on the left and on the right, what looks like electrical fluctuations, but they're being imaged because we took a fluorescent voltage indicator, a molecule that lights up when a brain cell is active and expressed it in the fish. And we can do something similar with worms. So let's end on a note of how we think about the process of innovation. The two stories I told you about, expansion, microscopy, and optogenetics both follow a common pattern. First, we invented a tool that could give us deep scientific insight. Second, we gave it to many groups to help them make discoveries. Third, we would get involved and help design practical applications, such as our hope for early disease detection with expansion microscopy and our hopes for new therapeutics that were inspired by optogenetics. Finally, we hope that these last step designs will eventually be deployable into the world. So with that, I want to end on this slide because in these short form talks, I don't know if I have time to acknowledge everybody, but I do want to end on this slide because these are large, not just interdisciplinary, but even omnidisciplinary topics. We're fusing together optics and chemistry, genetic engineering and ecology, bringing together all these different fields. And it's really a global effort. All of our tools, as I mentioned, can be freely read about, and we have even tutorials on our website, synthneuro.org, in the upper right hand of the slide. And we're always eager to learn about new problems, build tools, and help people solve them. So don't hesitate to drop me a line if there's a possibility that we could help. And with that, I would love to take questions. Ed, thank you very much for a really inspiring and wonderfully clear talk. Absolutely amazing seeing that expanding brain and the beautiful optogenetic work. Thank you so much. So I'll start to uh, produce the questions that have come in on, on the Slido. Um, so the first one is from Anurin Kennelly, and it's how does the brain expansion process work with the blood vessel network? Yeah. So we're not just expanding cells away from each other, we're expanding the molecules within cells apart from each other. So blood vessels get bigger, the space inside the blood vessel gets bigger, the cells that make the blood vessel walls also get bigger. So amazingly, um, we've applied this down to a wide variety of tissue types, a wide variety of species, and the tissues and uh, and, and components of the tissues are all getting bigger. So it's almost like you draw a picture on a balloon and you blow it up. All the ink particles are separating on the balloon, but it's the same picture. And so yes, many people are now using the tools to study blood vessels. Already one study has come out looking at blood vessels from uh, uh, patients who had epilepsy. So in epilepsy and neurosurgery, part of the brain might be removed. They use expansion to look at the blood vessels and see how they were changed in the state of epilepsy. And a related question, can expansion microscopy observe live activities? Great question. We've not figured out how to expand a living thing. The problem of course, is that we're anchoring the biomolecules in place and in the living state, biomolecules need to move around. So uh, I don't think that would be possible, but maybe you could study partially living things. So, you know, um, a group at Stanford had showed that you could expand bacteria, but if you leave out one ingredient, then they don't expand completely. And so maybe you could make mechanical measurements inside bacterial cell walls by leaving some of the structure and interaction intact. Um there's quite a bit of support for this question, which is, can you explain more, expand on how light turns neurons on and off? Sure. So the basic idea of how we use light to turn neurons on and off is the neurons don't normally respond to light, but we can transplant light sensors into them. The light sensors are the same ones that microbes like bacteria and algae use to mediate primitive photosynthesis, or to help them swim, swim around and navigate. So in a nutshell, we take the gene that encodes for a light sensor out of a microbe, 
we put the gene into the brain using a virus or a gene therapy vector, and those are very common. They've been invented by many other groups. We wait a few weeks and the brain cells start to manufacture the gene product, these light sensors. Then we can take a laser or a light emitting diode and shine light onto the brain. The light will hit those sensors and be converted into electricity. And that's what activates the brain cell. A very broad one here. Do you think that we have the computing power to build a relatively accurate brain model in the near future? Great question. Well, the human brain is very, very complicated. If we were to image the entire human brain and to store all those images on hard drives and stack the drives on top of each other, uh, for one human brain, that stack of hard drives would, would go into outer space from the surface of the earth. So we're talking about gigantic amounts of data. But if we start with a small brain, maybe it's possible. That's our hope anyway. So our dream now, which I would like to convert into a plan, is to be able to look at the activity in a small brain, control it, and then make a map. If we could simulate a small brain, that would be very helpful in knowing how difficult the problem is for simulating a larger brain. But it's possible that simulating a small brain will teach us something about how the brain works. And maybe we don't have to simulate the whole human brain in order to understand it. We don't know for sure, of course. This is what I sometimes like to call real science. There's not like a textbook telling us what to do. So it's very exploratory. Is there any evidence or even a suggestion that brains may use self-generated light naturally within themselves? Great question. Um, well, there are many brain cells, even in the mammalian brain, that do have light sensors in them. And to be honest, I don't think we, there's any consensus on what they're for. But for example, um, there are uh, molecules called opsins, which are very similar in overall architecture to the opsins I, I mentioned, although their sequences are quite different. And you can find them in brain cells, uh, even deep inside the brain. So how does light get there? Is it going in through certain channels or is, it, is there enough dim light somehow getting across our hair and scalp and skull to get in there? Uh, we don't know. I mean, uh, this is an active area of research um, that I'm not personally involved with, but uh, it's very intriguing to wonder what are these light sensors doing deep in the brain? Um, there are two related questions. Um, can you be sure expansion microscopy doesn't alter the structure or organization of the biomolecules? And then related with the expansion system, is there a significant pressure differential interfering with cellular activity? So to answer the first question, the expansion is not perfect, but it's a very small error is introduced. If you expand an object um, what we see is that over the field of view of a microscope, which is sort of a typical size that we image in biology, there's about a few percent of error. But the vast majority of biological questions are not about the exact distance between two points. They're about the relative organization of things. And so hundreds of experimental studies are coming out doing expansion because a few percent of error is okay. That said, we are working to improve the technology even better. Um, as far as the activity goes, so the expansion process that we're applying is being applied to preserve specimens. So we've anchored all the biomolecules in place. This is not a method for imaging a living thing. So we get a cancer biopsy from a patient or we get a brain specimen from a brain bank. But even having a fundamental map of a preserved cell or tissue is very helpful the same way that a map of a city might be static, but it's very helpful to figure out the lay of the land. And now a, a memory question. Is there any possibility of observing the effect of making a new memory in neurons using expansion microscopy? Great question. I think some groups are headed in that direction. If a memory is stored by a change of the wiring of the brain, 
then seeing that pattern can be very helpful. The same way that seeing a change in wiring of an artificial neural network, you know, those are used in machine learning, can help you understand an artificial pattern of storage of memory. So uh, I think that's a very exciting direction. And, and my hope is that in the coming years, uh, maybe, maybe we will see what our memory looks like in the actual wiring of the brain. And then expansion in another direction, your focus with the light sensitization of neurons is clearly focused on control of the brain as an investigative tool. But it seems to me it could also be very useful as an interface allowing information to be input to the brain, say to allow input of sensory data. Is that a current area of work? Well, our group is um, currently focused on how to build tools for science because the lack of understanding of the brain is one of the reasons why it's so hard to cure people. And as I mentioned with the example that Liwei led, uh, where the optogenetics was used to derive a principle of therapy, but then the implementation and sound human trials was done through a, uh, um, a non-invasive method. Uh, there's a lot of appeal for making the final therapy design as non-invasive and um, democratized as possible. That said, um, there is a group in France, uh, Gensight Biologics, a company that is running human trials for blindness with the crimson molecule that I said, uh, that, I, that I mentioned earlier. So it may be possible. I think if such early trials go well, then the door might be open to many others, but we don't know for sure. Okay, this one's not strictly related to your talk, it's a rather general brain question, but how is it that 40 hertz stimulation can cause the brain to heal? Oh, it's a great question. Uh, right now, uh, under Li Wei's leadership, uh, we, a whole set of people is investigating this. Um, there's some evidence that blood flow improves to the brain. Also, a cell type in the brain called microglia go into a less inflammatory state. But what is the first cause, right? Does the blood flow improve and then inflammation goes down? Or does inflammation go down and then blood flow improves? The exact chain of events is still being figured out. But it's kind of remarkable if you think about it, right? You have something coming into your eyes and your ears and it's changing the molecular recipe of the brain. Such a strategy, if it could be generalized to many brain diseases, might transform how we think about brain therapeutics. Do you think it's possible in the future to understand genetic diseases using this idea of expanding minuscule parts of the body? I hope so. Over the last four weeks, we've announced two new inventions. In one of them, we expand the brain and then we sequence the gene expression right there inside the expanded brain. Now, what does that mean? Well, when you sequence a gene, you're basically copying it. And as you copy it, you use glowing uh, DNA bases. So it basically blinks out its identity over time. Well, why couldn't you do the sequencing while a gene is still inside the brain? And so just about a week ago, we announced this technology that we call expansion sequencing. We expand the brain and then we sequence the expressed genes right there inside the expanded brain. So let's you pinpoint where genes are expressed and not just which ones. So it's very early days. We literally just announced this technology, but my hope is that we can start to apply this to combine sequencing, which of course is one of the most powerful biotechnologies of our time, and imaging, which is another one of the most powerful biotechnologies of our time. Now we're trying to figure out if we can fuse them together. I think this is a kind of single cell question. Mm -hmm. Wonderful talk, great insights. What are your projections regarding exploring the interaction of light, so I guess optogenetics, with elements of the genome, transcriptome, proteome, and epigenome that shape brain structure and function, uh, in other words, combining them at a combinatorial level? Yeah, great question. So our optogenetic tools are focused on controlling the electrical activity of brain cells, but many other people are developing new molecules that will convert light into some other signal. And indeed, people are working on ways to activate genes with light, to change the genome with light, to turn on certain signals with light, and so on and so forth. So 
Uh, this is not my area of expertise, but it does seem that this general theme of controlling physiology with light is really starting to accelerate. My dream would be, let's say 10 years from now, suppose you have a whole set of molecules that let you, let, let you eavesdrop on a cell and see what it's doing, and then a whole second set of molecules that let you control all those pathways, both to figure out which ones are important and potentially to discover new therapeutic ideas. How will we be able to apply light to specific neurons in a non-intrusive manner? Yeah, great question. Well, there are people working on effectively holographic projectors for the brain. So basically, a holographic projector creates a three-dimensional sculpture of light. Light will go here and here and here, but not the places in between. If the places where you aim light are where individual brain cells are located, you could kind of dial in an arbitrary pattern into the brain, or what some of my colleagues like to call playing the brain like a piano. So my colleague, Valentina Emiliani in Paris, has developed some of these holographic projectors for the brain. And my team, we developed some molecules that are a good match for the properties of our holographic projector. And a few years ago, we showed that indeed, you could activate individual cells in an arbitrary order by combining that hardware with our molecules. So potentially you could put in a very complex 3D pattern without going into the brain itself through this kind of strategy, but it's early days. So these tools for discovery are absolutely wonderful. And also you explained very clearly how they can be used in diagnostics. Do you see either the expansion technique or the optogenetic technique potentially being used as therapy? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I don't know if the expansion could be used directly as a therapy, maybe as a diagnostic, if it were to go through clinical trials. The optogenetics, so um, maybe you can say a bit more about what the blindness trial is trying to see. So millions of people have a condition called retinitis pigmentosa. This is a disease where photoreceptor cells in the eye atrophy or die off. So the idea that um, Gensite Biologics and others are putting forth is, what if you could take a light sensitive molecule like the kind I talked about and put it into the eye, into the spared cells that remain? Could you convert part of the, re of the remaining component of the eye into a virtual camera, replacing the lost function that the photoreceptor death de deprived the person of? And, um, so in animals like mice and non-human primates, this seems to work. Um, you know, mice might, be, uh, might have lost these photoreceptors in a genetic model. If you replace the function by adding the light sensors to other eye cells, the mice can then solve a maze. They can see where to go. So the big question I think is, you know, these molecules, they come from bacteria, they come from algae, they come from other microbes. Will the human body tolerate them. Because of course, there is the immune system, which will fight foreign invaders, right? And most of us, of course, don't have microbes or algae in our, in our body, in our eyes anyway. Um, and so I think that's a big question. If these molecules are well tolerated by the human body, maybe a whole field will take off of gene therapy to add light sensation to brain cells and other cells in the body. But it all, I think, depends on whether the immune system of the body will reject it or not. Interesting. Um, anonymous question, is there any downside to expanding parts of the brain in this manner? I think question about, you know, what are the potential artifacts and problems with the, the approach? Yeah. Well, so as I mentioned earlier, the expansion is not perfect. You do introduce a few percent of error. And the other uh, thing that's worth mentioning, of course, is that if you expand a system like the brain, then it's no longer a living thing. Um, that said, it seems to be very useful. You know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of research groups are doing expansion to look at bacteria, plant cells, um, kidney disease, uh, different cancer types, um, DNA in the nucleus. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. And uh, 
you know, it's a very practical way of doing nano imaging. It's the first method that I know of that lets you do nano imaging without requiring any, any hardware. You can just use ordinary lab equipment that most people already can access. And uh, uh, so it's turning out to be very useful in classrooms. It's being useful in all sorts of settings. You know, because biology in the end is a nanoscale science, right? Biomolecules, genes, gene products, these are nanoscale things often organized with nanoscale precision. If we can make nanoscale imaging powerful and inexpensive and easy enough for everybody to use, then I think many discoveries will be facilitated. Okay, here's another one that's um, very general. How can red light be used to treat blindness? Yeah, so in the plan that we're putting forth, um, or that maybe more accurately Genset Biologics is putting forth, um, we have this molecule crimson. It's a red light activator of neurons. And we discovered this in 2014. You can use a virus or gene therapy vector to deliver the gene for crimson into the eye. Now, if you recall, I, I explained that the photoreceptor cells have died off, but the eye is full of other cells. You can put the crimson molecule into those other cells. Then when red light enters the eye, it'll fall upon those newly photosensitized cells. And then the question is, can you get enough information to the brain to see an image? So we participated in a couple such studies, uh, you know, for example, with mice um, and uh, with an earlier molecule, blind mice that were equipped with a light sensor in their eyes in a certain cell called the bipolar cell, they were able to solve a maze by navigating to a platform. And so if that works in humans, then maybe blind people could see it again. What have we learned about important questions to ask about neural net modeling? Great question. So, um, just a few sentences of background. The field of artificial intelligence and machine learning is in part inspired by neuroscience insights about how neurons are plastic and how they are connected. But those neuroscience insights are many decades old. I hope that we're gonna learn a lot in the coming years through technologies like the expansion method of exactly how neurons are wired in great detail. Those wiring diagrams might provoke new models of how the brain generates things that we cannot yet replicate with artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence uh, is good at playing chess. They can meet people at go. They can solve protein structures. Um, but I think there's a lot of hope for what people are calling artificial general intelligence, something that could solve major problems, for example, or do things that we consider creative. Um, and uh, one possibility is that a very detailed map of the brain could suggest new algorithms or new architectures that neural nets could then use. And um, there was a question about optogenetics, whether it could be used to um, manipulate synchronous firings of, of different neurons in mm -hmm. the brain. Absolutely. Yeah, so the brain has all sorts of brain waves or oscillations, coordinated firings of many neurons at once. And one thing that you can do with optogenetics is to cancel out those firings by suppressing them, or you can insert noise into the brain to desynchronize these oscillations. Many people are doing such studies to look at how emotion and cognition circuits in the brain or other kinds of interactions are controlled by oscillatory activity. So for example, um, there are all sorts of patterns in the brain that are involved with um, memory formation, with fear, um, with uh, benefits to reduce depression-like or other symptoms. And very often when people you do optogenetic stimulation, they're driving the brain at a certain rhythmic frequency. And so I think what is emerging is indeed sort of a map of these frequencies and what they can do when delivered to different parts of the brain and how that has an effect on behavior. Mm 
And there's a question about targeting with the optogenetics. How can you target the brain cells you want using a viral vector? Won't it affect all of the cells? Yeah, great question. So this is not my field, but the whole field of gene therapy has come up with tons of methods for targeting some cells and not others with a virus. Or you can have a virus infect many cells, but there's a small piece of DNA called a regulatory region or a promoter, which means the gene will only turn on in some cells and not others. So for example, I mentioned the basket cells that Li Wei targeted many years ago, the beginning of that Alzheimer's story I mentioned. They used a virus called the adeno-associated virus. They also um, used a genetic trick where only certain neurons that make a protein called parvalbumin would be able to activate the expression of that virally delivered gene. And there are all sorts of uh, different, this is actually sort of a complicated trick involving a thing called a promoter, a thing called a recombinase, and another thing called um, a recombinase target site. But to make a long story short, the field of gene therapy has invented all sorts of cool methods for helping with the gene regulation in cell types. This sounds very exciting. This is from um, Felicity. I'm no scientist, but I'm interested in how this might be able to be used in treating multiple sclerosis in terms of messages being interrupted or sent to the appropriate places. Could this help temporary disability? Perhaps, yeah. I mean, I'm not a doctor. Uh, in the context of brain diseases, I'm much more on the inventing side. But we love to collaborate with people and apply the expansion method to figure out what is wrong at the nanoscale in a pathological state. And then with the optogenetics, we can try to help see if driving a pattern of activity can overcome a problem. So if there is uh, anybody listening to this who would like to collaborate on applying such a tool to such a problem, um, we'd love to share our technology and, and help. But uh, um, that's kind of how uh, one of our operating models is to collaborate with world, world experts in different diseases or different scientific topics and then help uh, use the tools to address them. But, uh, but I'm not an expert on multiple sclerosis myself. Well, I think we'd all agree that one of the most inspiring things about your work is the way that you're disseminating technology to the world. I mean, it's really terrific. It must be obvious from the enormous number of questions that have come in, and there are still lots on the Slido, um, and also just the number of participants on the Zoom that, I mean, this has been a, a really wonderful lecture and thank has you. created great interest in the audience. So Ed, thank you so much for giving the 2020 Croonian lecture. It was absolutely terrific. Well, thank you. Yeah, well, we're always excited to help people solve more problems with new technology, so. I think you'll be hearing from people. Wonderful. Thank you. Have a great day.